Is this the beginning of an exodus? If it is, should we be worried? Should local governments be doing anything? To help us understand all this, we'll talk with Rachel Massaro, Director of Research for Joint Venture Silicon Valley. And then Council Member Pam Foley will tell us what's going on in her Cambrian Pioneer Council District. We'll conclude with part two of our interview with Becky Morgan, a county supervisor and then state senator from 1985 to 1993. That's what's coming up on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Rachel Massaro, Director of Research for Joint Venture Silicon Valley. So tell us what that means. What do you do? How did you get there? What's Joint Venture Silicon Valley all about? Sure, so Joint Venture is a nonprofit public-private partnership. It was created back in 1993 really to bring leaders of all the sectors together around our regional issues, things that everyone cares about, housing, transportation, education, all sorts of things. Um, my background personally is in physical sciences. I actually mm. studied oceanography and then climate science. Really? And I joined Joint Venture back in 2009 to work on our energy and sustainability initiatives. I had the opportunity to work on some fantastic programs, some of which are still going strong now. Um, but when we launched the Institute for Regional Studies back in 2014, I decided to kind of shift gears, change roles within the organization, and leverage my background in data and data analysis right. to economic and community health trends. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. And it's, it's been a wild ride. I mean, I've, I've got to work on hundreds of data sets every year and kind of have become a, a data generalist, taking a deep dive on certain topics every once in a while, and then doing our annual report that kind of covers them all once a year. That's the Silicon Valley Index. The Silicon Valley Index, and we release it every year at our annual State of the Valley event in February. Next one coming up in February. Yep, the 2020 yep. Index. And that's kind of the data Bible for or the valley. Oh, I love to hear you, that. You wouldn't say that, but <laughs> I do love to hear is. that. It's, it's really we try very hard at the institute to make the indicators in there, and we had 190 charts and tables last year. So it's really mm -hmm. wide ranging across a variety of topics: employment, income, education, uh, environment, everything. But um, we try to make it relevant to everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, we we say we want this to be relevant at the dinner table in the boardroom and in the council chambers, just everywhere. These are topics that we all care about and that we, all, we should all know about. And this is easily accessible, just Google Google or whatever yep. search engine yep. you use. Yeah, it's on Joint Ventures Joint website. Venture. Yeah. And we also have an online data hub that makes the data readily available and accessible to the public. And that's siliconvalleyindicators.org. It's a separate website. And that's a great service. Thank you for, thank you and Joint Venture for doing that. Well, our topic today is uh, Exodus. Yes. Uh, people bailing out, leaving the valley. Between 2013 and 2017, something like 35,000, over 35,000 people left the Bay Area. Over 8,000 people left this valley, Santa Clara County. Uh, so people are leaving. Who's going? Why are they going? Yeah, we hear a lot of words like exodus and uh, fleeing or looking for greener pastures. Bailing and out. I, it sound, bailing yeah. out, yeah. It sounds like people are leaving en masse and we're just, yeah. we're losing all these people and soon we're going to have no one. <laughs> um, so of course we're very data driven at the Institute and so my job is to bring the numbers. Um, for Silicon Valley specifically, over the last like three years or so, we've been um, kind of evening out between the net uh, foreign immigrants coming in, about 20,000 a year, and the net, net domestic migrants going out. So again, these are net numbers. Yeah. Um, foreign immigrants coming in, uh, domestic migrants going out to other parts of the state and the nation. Um, so again, it's, it's about evened out. Now, to put it in perspective, um, it sounds like a lot, 20,000 per year, and it is a lot. It's, it's like one in every 30 people you know every five years, so if that gives you some sense. Um, but it's not very much compared to what we saw after the dot-com bust, when we were seeing for a sustained period of time about 50,000 domestic out migrants per year. So that just kind of puts it in perspective. Was there a net loss of population then at the dot-com bust, or was it still Kind of even I believe out. there was. Yeah. I'm going to say not, there was. Not a big one, I expect. <laughs> and right now, it's not a net loss. It's, we're still growing a, a little bit. It's actually a little bit of a loss. A little bit of a loss. It's a little bit negative. Yeah, we've yeah. always had 
foreign immigrants coming in. So yeah. that's nothing new. So yeah, this net loss is really what's changing our population of dynamics. Of course, people are having babies too. Yeah, although yeah. Our, our birth rate has declined yeah. significantly since 2008. In fact, it's lower now than it was since the 1980s when the, the baby boomers were having their babies. Um, so it, the, the birth rate is low and the death rate is actually high. So it's, there's this concept called pro-cyclical mortality, which is a whole other topic, but it's very <laughs> fascinating. The death rate is up, the birth rate is down, and yet our population is still growing. So, so births minus deaths. Population death. is also aging, yeah, which has something to do with both lower birth rate and higher death rate, right? Yeah, it's all right. related. Um, but so suffice us to say that our population in Silicon Valley is still growing over time. We're at about 3.1 mi uh, million now, but um, but it's not growing as fast as it was before. So we're not Detroit. Mm -mm. We're not even Silicon Valley after the dot-com bust. Uh, it's we're, we're we're kind of breaking even, but still, yeah, twenty thousand people are leaving every year. Who are they? Well, it's interesting. It's it's a complex is issue, of course, from yeah. all sorts of standpoints, from the policy standpoint, from the emotional standpoint, because we can feel the tension here. We feel the traffic, we feel the housing um, issues that are driving people out, but from a data standpoint, it's actually quite complicated too. So it's easier to look at the ins, because when people come into the region, yeah. they become part of our demographic, part of our survey, our sample survey, and so then we, we can kind of look at, at all angles of who they are that's coming in. The people that are going out, it's a little bit harder. We tend to take a variety of different data sets and put them together to try to to kind of fit the puzzle pieces together. Um, we do have an out-migration of tech talent. It's not mm -hmm. just that people are being pushed out of the, uh, out of the region for economic reasons. Um, there is some out-migration of tech talent, a few thousand a year to Seattle, a few thousand a year to Austin. Austin. They're, they're the places that yeah, you would think. Sure. Um, Portland is another one, Nevada presumably Reno and Vegas um, are other ones. And there is a lot of out-migration that's just happening locally here within the Bay Area and the outskirts. So about 1,000 people per year are leaving Silicon Valley and going to Alameda County. So oh, they right. are, yeah. a large share of them are probably still commuting in for their yeah. jobs. People are moving out to Contra Costa County. Slightly more affordable housing in those places. Exactly, right? well, yeah. to put it in perspective, um, a lot of people are moving to San Joaquin and Sacramento too, and in Sacramento, 60% of potential first-time home buyers can afford a median-priced home. Uh -huh. Here in Silicon Valley, it's closer to 25%. 20, yeah. So it's, yeah. a, it's a lot more affordable in these other places. So uh, a bunch of my friends who are retirees are cashing in on their home equity and moving yes. to cheaper cheaper places so Absolutely. there's there's some of that uh, what surprised me most is my students at San Jose State they used to they came from here and they stayed here when they graduated now that's hard for them to do so these are Millennials now so they're starting to move out and some of them are probably techies that are that are there that are, have job mobility but others just the, the the overall cost of living is is driving them out but we need to keep this in perspective <laughs> it's it's not a mass exodus yeah, well, you know, and I think sometimes we forget that this is a human issue, too. I mean, people are very tied to their communities. People are tied yeah. to their jobs, to their families. Um, people are tied to their, their homes, their community organizations, their church groups. Um, and a lot of people are sharing custody of children, so they, they don't have mobility. So when we look at who is leaving for economic or other reasons, um, we need to realize that it's going to be the mo more mobile people first. Uh -huh. So the younger generation, um, the people that don't have kids yet, yeah. the people that are in those professions that are more transferable to other places like community infrastructure and services jobs, retail, construction, education, healthcare, things like that, and the business services like accounting and legal and all that stuff. Um, kind of jobs that you could take and transplant to any other region, not kind of focused in or, or based on the tech economy. What about people earning minimum wage or just above that? How can they, how can they possibly stay here? And yet, it, it's many of them have social ties, of yep. course, that, that keep them here. Uh, and for others, uh, even moving is expensive and, and beyond their beyond their means. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to those service workers? And that's starting to include teachers and professors and 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 people in what what have been professional jobs now too. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing to note is that I think the struggle is felt across a lot of income levels. I mean, I, I, you can see that in the housing burden. The housing burden for homeowners with a mortgage and renters yeah. is really high, and, and there's a huge share of people that are spending more than half of their gross income on housing. That's their gross income. That's not even after taxes. It leaves almost nothing after that. So the people who are really hit the hardest, um, you, you know, we find a third of our households can't meet their basic needs without assistance and sometimes that assistance comes in the form of public assistance sometimes it's in the form of families or um, living in a multi-generational household or mm -hmm. having their parents watch their children or what have you and without their community they don't have that so moving to another even more affordable region doesn't afford them all of the services that they need but the second part of your question really was what is our region going to do without these workers? If they leave, doesn't this leave like a gaping hole? Um, and it's part of a bigger problem. I mean, the challenge is that um, it seems like a good thing. Our region continues to grow. Our companies are doing well. They're growing. Employment levels are increasing. And at the same time, the unemployment rate is really low. I mean, economists call this full employment. Yeah. So we don't have the workers to fill new jobs. It's a little jobs. over 3%, or around 3%? Maybe? It's a little yeah. bit less, I think. Yeah, less than 3%? Wow. Yeah, I think it's yeah. a little less. And um, compounding it is the fact that uh, the baby boomers are retiring. Yeah. And they're leaving these jobs. Yeah. Some, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's providing some opportunities yeah. on the one hand, and on the other hand, we are going to have to fill those positions. And um, there are a lot of things that we can do. We can better train our young people to fill those jobs. We can, and compete with the worldwide tech talent for those high, high skill, high wage jobs. Um, we can increase the housing affordability and the, the, the amount of housing that we have for our population here in Silicon Valley, or we can allow people, workers, to live in the commute shed and make it easier, hopefully easier, for them to commute in. So there are a lot of different solutions, there are a lot of different ways to address it, but it's a bigger problem than just the jobs being left over by people leaving yeah. the region. Let's go back a step. We talked a little bit about where techies are going, where, where they're moving to. What about people more generally? What, what states or regions are attracting our, our Valley residents? Yeah, you know, when I looked at the numbers, it, the, the biggest numbers were Nevada and the outskirts of the Bay Area, so not actually all that oh, far. Yeah. And I, I tried to zoom in onto Florida because I thought, well, people are retiring, we'll see a big uh, migration to Florida, and the numbers really weren't as high as I thought they were. And I was looking over a five-year data set. Yeah, beyond where are they going? Um, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and the Mercury News did a survey that showed 44% reported that 44% said they're thinking about leaving in the next few years. Do you, is that credible to you? Is that high? So I believe that that many people are thinking about leaving. Yeah. I believe that many people kind of deeply feel the, the, the troubles of the region and want to go. Do I think that all of those people are actually gonna go anywhere? Not really. I mean, it's, um, it's about less than 1% of our population that's actually moving out every year, which is, it's a big number, yeah. but it's not 44% or 56% or of millennials or, or what the poll showed. Um, so I do think it's a little bit, um, it's indicative of how people feel more than what their actions will be. And you've said that one of the places that people are going or some of the places that people are going are not out of state at all. But within the state, Alameda County, Contra Costa County, Sacramento, San Joaquin, and so on. Okay, so housing is cheaper there. They've addressed one of their problems. But one of the other things that makes life here unpleasant is traffic and commuting. So yeah. they're actually exacerbating that part of the, of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. So every year we have about 30,000 people that are just moving around or shuffling within the Bay Area. And, um, and I, I, I did mention some of the counties that they're moving to. Um, were, when we put together all these different data sets to figure out what's going on, um, we get a better picture. So we looked at 
the mega commuters or super commuters, they go by many terms, but people who are commuting more than three hours round trip each way, which is yeah. significant. And um, that share has just risen and risen and risen year over year. Um, now it's up to about 100,000 people per day, per weekday that are commuting three into hours? the region more than three hours wow. daily. Those are Silicon Valley employees yeah. that work everywhere. And in fact, the census has this tool where you can um, select your county and it, it, it plays this little um, image of a video of, of where people are going and where they're coming to. And it's incredible to watch how far and wide our employees are coming from. And, and frankly, a lot of them are um, sleeping here during the week, sleeping in oh, their right. cars, sure. on someone's couches, um, on someone's couch just to kind of uh, make it work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it brings up one of those things that we need to keep in mind, which is um, this is not just an issue of putting workers near their jobs. I mean, people live in different places for lots of reasons, but it's a, it's a quality of life issue. Absolutely. This yeah. is not okay to spend that much yeah. time daily. It's, it's mostly wasted time, unless you're listening to a fabulous podcast, I suppose, but uh, <laughs> mostly wasted time. So we're getting near the end of our time. So what I'm getting from you is there is there there's an exodus, but it's not extreme. We don't need to panic about it. But at the same time, there are all these factors like housing and traffic and other things that are reducing the quality of life here significantly. So it seems like government, local or state, should be doing something ab about this to, ad to address these problems and mitigate the circumstances of especially these super commuters, what should government be doing? Well, I'll start with the, the focus on the, the problems instead of the exodus. So really what we're dealing with here is um, housing, unaffordability, the lack of supply, and the transportation challenges that go along with that. Our region has historically benefited significantly from having foreign immigrants come in. Yeah. Um, should our giant tech companies uh, still be attracting the best talent from around the world? Yes, of, co of course they should, right? Um, but at the same time, on the back end, we need to deal with the issues that are caused by people coming in, particularly for high-skill, high-wage jobs, and it changes the dynamics of the housing supply and you know where people can afford to live. Um, and so, what what role does government have? Okay, so uh, you know, on the state, be quick because we're virtually out of time. <laughs> There are a lot of different policies and programs, and I won't say which is the right one, but I'll say that um, we really need regional housing and transportation yes. solutions. We all need Not to work together yeah. to make this happen. Okay. Rachel Massaro, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm San Jose Council Member Pam Foley, representing the residents of San Jose District 9. Our district includes Cambrian Park, South Willow Glen, and all the neighborhoods between Highway 87 and Bascom Avenue. I've been in office for less than a year now, but I'm pleased to report we've made great progress making San Jose safer, more pedestrian friendly, more affordable, and more vibrant. Earlier this year, we created a survey to ask residents what they wanted. I'm happy to report most of these requests were approved and will be implemented over the coming year. These include traffic calming measures at the intersection of New Jersey and Foxworthy, an enhanced crosswalk with flashing beacons at both Coke Lane and Marshall Way, and another at the intersection of Lee and Charmoran. Additionally, we improved the Camden Community Center's resources by providing the funds to purchase a new passenger van that will now spend less time at the mechanics and more time transporting our youth and seniors. Something I often hear from residents is their concern about public safety. To help our police department solve crime, and as a deterrent, we are offering our residents a rebate on security camera purchases. To attain a rebate, residents must provide a copy of their receipt and register their camera on the SJPD website. Look for the details on this program in our upcoming newsletter. Lastly, we are focused on making San Jose more affordable so our kids and hardworking residents can afford to live here. To do that, we must build more housing with development near transit stations and in the downtown core. 
and is a proponent of accessory dwelling units, look for financing programs and fee reduction possibilities that will help increase our supply of housing. We are committed to improving the quality of life of our residents. Please let us know how we can help. You can contact our office by phone or email. Thank you and have a great day. Now here's part two of our interview with Becky Morgan, who served on the County Board of Supervisors from 1980 to 84, and then in the State Senate until 1993. As you'll see, her public service did not end then. Let's take a look. You'll have your votes. And that but he's was with, Speaker of the Assembly. He was, yes, but the, And you're in the Senate. But, but legislation has to go to both houses yeah. oh, and then to the okay. governor to you're be passed. You're one vote short in both I houses? I was one short vote in yeah. the Assembly. In the Assembly, I see. And of course, he's from San Francisco. That helped. Where the train goes. Yeah. But yeah. I think also the point I want to make is those were the days when people helped each other. So yeah, uh, people and should remember he was a very liberal Democrat. Absolutely. You were a moderate Republican in, mm -hmm. the, sta in the state but, Senate. But he saw the purpose and he respected the fact that I was carrying it and got me the last vote I needed to make the Joint Powers Agreement happen. And Governor Duke Majan, a Republican, mm -hmm. didn't want to save the rail line in the first place, but he signed the legislation? He did after two years. It took me two years, but it happened. And I'd like to make a point about the collaboration yeah. that we had in those days. Yeah. Obviously, you really didn't vote on all my bills yeah. or other Democrats, because at that time I was a Republican, which I am not any longer. but. I, two things I tell young women are get a sport and, and reach out because I play, uh, I skied in the competition with the Nevada legislature and got to know Tom Hayden huh. from California. Tom Hayden, a very, very liberal. A very, very Democrat, liberal. Democrat. And then I played tennis with Gary Hart, a moderate Democrat. Yeah. And when I needed huh. a vote for something that was really important to me, they would talk with me. And if it wasn't offensive to them or against their political uh, beliefs, um, they'd make sure I had the votes. And they were both other state senators at that time. Yes. Yeah. No, Tom Hayden at that time was in the assembly. He was in the assembly. Gary Hart was yeah. in the Senate, and yeah. he was chair of the education committee that I was vice chair for. So your advice is get a sport. It helped me. <laughs> <laughs> we got to have some way to get to know people Absolutely. beyond the chambers, right? Yeah. Yep. And I suppose for women, you don't go to Fat no, Franks No, the men would go the out and have a drink after yeah. work or whatever. Um, that's not comfortable for me Yeah. Uh, to go to a bar with another man. I was a married woman and doing my job, but I wasn't invited occasionally to go to Frank Fats, which was the watering hole. Yeah. Uh, and with uh, Ken Maddy, head of the Republicans in the Senate, yeah. and with uh, Speaker Brown. You got reelected twice, but then you resigned in your what would have been your third term, right? Right. To become CEO of Joint Venture Silicon Valley. Why did that interest you? Why why was that more interesting than serving out your Senate term? In 1993, mm -hmm. I had asked Governor Wilson to appoint me as state superintendent of schools when Bill Honig was removed from office mm -hmm. because of some fraud. It wasn't going to happen. In the middle of that time, I got a call from the recruiter for Joint Venture Silicon Valley, which was a new startup idea here in the Valley. And I said, let's talk. And when they shared what they were trying to do to bring government, business, and the Civic Center together mm -hmm. and to focus some of the issues that they needed, like streamlining the regulatory process, uh, helping the schools do a better job mm -hmm. and including their business offices. Uh, those, those projects, if you will, those challenges interested me. And so when they offered me the job, I, because I would have also been termed out. Oh, right. It would have been your last term. It was term. my last term. Yeah. And so I took the opportunity to come back home and uh, help out in Silicon Valley. And what do you think you achieved? in that role at Joint Venture? I don't know how much carryover there's been, but at the time, I think we may have had some impact. For instance, the cities came together mm -hmm. to streamline their regulatory process yes. and to unify their building codes so that 
companies could build more quickly, provide yeah. jobs sooner. And then we also put about $25 million into our schools during that five years. Business people would come in and help them improve their business offices. We brought in curriculums that were successful in other places mm -hmm. uh, that they integrated into the work of the, their schools. Uh, we got people working together kindergarten through 12th grade because, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, it's pretty broken up. There are only two unified school districts, yeah. K-12. So we got them what we called the vertical slice, uh -huh. getting superintendents and principals working together, K-12. Well, that's a fair amount to, to accomplish. <laughs> so you were actually one of the last Republicans to get elected in Santa Clara County. We had the actual last one, Jim Kinneen, got elected to the assembly after, after yes, your term. Yes, and he worked on my staff office. for two years. Oh, that's right. Uh, uh, but Republicans are a small minority in this, in this county now. Uh, the party's changed. Jim's left the party. So uh, have I. You left the, you've left the party. I was going to ask you what your views yeah. are, are on the party today and where you are. Well, I went declined to state in early 2000s. I didn't say I left the party, the party left me. Mm. And the m moderation, I mean, I grew up in the Pete McCloskey era. Yeah. He was a mentor of mine. And I grew up in Vermont where we never knew a Democrat until I was <laughs> in my <laughs> late 20s. Yeah. And, um, but the focus on moderation and on only what you know, people can't do for themselves of the Lincoln era and the highway system of the Eisenhower era. Those were Republicans that did important things in my mind, and it was not happening. Um, and so I went declined to state, and um, now because of the open primary, I can vote, you can vote either way. That's right. <laughs> and uh, I do. Jim Kinneen says he's ready to work on a new, a new third party, a, a, a new party anyway. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested in something like that? I see the value in it. In yeah. fact, um, a moderate Democrat that set in, you know, you have dual seats in the Senate, and a moderate Democrat and I often voted similarly, and we said, we need to start a new party. Yeah. Um, it's a long timeline, and uh, as someone age 80, I think I'll let the younger generation okay. do this. Well, meanwhile, I know you're busy with the Morgan Family Foundation. I want to hear about <laughs> the work you do there and especially about the Northern Sierra Partnership, uh, which I think okay. has had some really exciting news recently. Tell us about, about those projects. Yeah, we have been blessed to be, have the resources to have a family foundation, and we give to many organizations that already exist, about 150 or 60 get grants a year. And I should have hastened to say we don't take unsolicited <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, requests. Well, I was just filling out my application. <laughs> Uh, but three th uh, nonprofits that we, our family started uh, in the last 20 years um, included the Northern Sierra Partnership, where there's just such precious property up there. And the pressure from Reno to move into the Northern Sierra, mm -hmm. the pressure of Silicon Valley to move up to the area was just going to be wiping out all the natural resources. And so we put five nonprofits together, including land trusts. And uh, it's a five million acre region um, of which we're just trying to save about 100,000 acres of property, uh, rivers, lakes. So animals flow through more easily mm -hmm. and people continue to have recreation. Just 100,000 acres. Well, we're up to 80,000 well, now. Well, that's a lot. That's a lot, <laughs> yes. but it's a big project. Yes, it is. So, so that's, I've been very happy about, um, helped get it started. Our, my husband is the chair of the partnership. But also one of my uh, important projects is teen success, where um, I, I guess being in the social service arena, I'm aware of some of the needs. And we work with teen mothers and their children, support them weekly, get them through high school, and a few of them are going on local? to college. This is throughout California, throughout California. but San Jose um, is a, a center. Uh -huh. um, there are over 700 children born to teen moms every year in San Jose. And 
we're trying to break through and have uh, removed two generations from poverty by helping the mothers succeed, helping the children learn to read, and just having a um, better life. Well, that's a lot of great accomplishments and a lot of good current projects yeah. as well. So congratulations and, and thanks for being with us today. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. We'll be back next month with an all-new Valley Politics. Meanwhile, you can catch up on previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. You can let us know what you think about our show and suggest future topics or guests by email at valleypolitics at createvsj.org or on Twitter at valley underscore politics and by following us on Facebook. And now that's all, folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics. See you next time.